Please write the date. Yeah, I'll write the date, which is now. So this is lecture 20 or 21. I'm baffled by the fact that in the previous lecture, I only covered two and a half pages of my notes. I'm not able to figure out what I did in that lecture. I think we reviewed the lecture before that. Anyway, yeah, so maybe I should have written this list here so that the camera could uh, record it. But anyway, somebody is writing. So we've got seven projects and maybe one more. <coughs> so as I was saying, I'll do some ABC or even just A and B of inflation in the next lecture. And uh, at least that's my plan. And then uh, somebody can take it from there. And what does that leave? Anyway, who's writing this list? You just email. Anybody, please, yeah, but one person, please agree to email it to me. Yeah. You are very great. Great, yeah. And anything else? So, yeah, this is enough, you think? So, <coughs> one, one person could be, could be car movement. Yeah, that's under rotating platforms. Rotating plus charge. Rotating plus charge, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, fine. I have no problem with that. What I would, I have thought, but I have not that much of an expert is that one would hear in each of these one would basically introduce the characteristics of the black hole and what, what is special about the black hole that's rotating or that's charged and then from there one can go all in the direction of the not ones. So people who do either of these projects are free to add. <coughs> anyway, the details of the project also once you choose the project you can modify the details. Okay. But anyway, the requirements of the project, I would say, is a report, type report, on the order of somewhere between five to eight pages. Um, and calculations, the uh, calculations or? Well, the calculations should be done by you in the sense that you should know how to do them, but you don't have to present the details in the report. But uh, in the seminar, we may. The seminars will be, you know, we'll all be there and we are all supposed to hassle every speaker with questions. So, that, at that time, uh, the question of uh, doing, knowing the calculations will arise. So, spinners? Spinners in the yeah. yeah. Now, actually, that is my currently my plan for next Thursday's lecture. So, I think I'll just about manage. And then, uh, <coughs> Uh, it probably can be developed actually for somebody who is, oh, it's a pet thing of mine perhaps because it's related with my PhD work, but um, the uh, field, but for somebody who is really into field theory uh, and especially thinks is thinking about super symmetry or super gravity as a possible future activity, then the spin 3 half or gravity no field, that's an interesting subject. And actually let me put it here. It's a nice project in the area of gravitation because the gravitino is a spin 3 half fermion that postulated to be a supersymmetric partner of the graviton. So just as root gr is the action for the graviton or for the gravity field, uh, there's a, some related action for a fermion and it involves some knowledge about orthonormal frames and all which I will be doing next week. And um, it uses... <coughs> I don't know whether gravity no field or whether the super gravity is perhaps the best way to call the project. Mostly it would basic super gravity. It's doable, I think, for somebody who has uh, reasonable familiarity with uh, Dirac uh, equation and fermion field theory. So not all of you perhaps have done it. Basic super gravity. Event. Anyway, for my, my dogma is that whatever the subject, now these are fairly tough all of these, but you know, you can always do, say something intelligent in five to seven pages, uh, but the work involved may be a little more than what you'll finally write down, because these are somewhat challenging conceptually. These, I think, are within, <coughs> these five I would rank as relatively easy, even if they may get a little technical, like the rotating black hole might be a little hard in calculational terms. But I don't think they are so challenging as the last three. But who knows? Then again, you know, inflation, it's challenging conceptually, but equations are not likely to be 
be that hard. So it depends what your motive is. Good. Okay. So now the so let me do one thing now that I should have done last time. Um, let's. Um, Yeah, so last time we did the cosmological redshift. So let me now make a few comments about. So today's lecture is again comments on various aspects on freedom equations. Again, we'll try to use them to get out whatever physical consequences we can. <coughs> and. Um, even before that, a preliminary comment is the following. Uh, A of t is the scale factor. Of course, this is the quantity of most interest to us when we discuss the cosmological metric. And A of t, if it's slowly varying, can be expanded like this. And here the coefficient would be A dot uh, at, uh, so, a of t is a of t0 plus t minus t0 into a dot at t0. Now a dot at t0 is a at t0 times the Hubble constant h0. So I can put h0. This times this is a dot at t0. And then there are other terms which <coughs> one can neglect only if a of t is sufficiently slowly varying. So t and t minus t0 is small. You can't expand a function if these coefficients are, if this thing is large, then you can't neglect the next term. Okay. Now, as you uh, last time we defined a of t over a of t zero as one plus z, where this z of t is the redshift. So, comparing these two things. We see that z, the redshift, is h0 times t minus t0 approximately because this thing is exactly 1 plus z, but it's approximately 1 plus this term only if we neglect all the other terms. So it's appro this holds approximately h0 times t minus t0. This is not functional dependence, but time multiplied by t minus t0. Now, what is t minus t0? So this is redshift of some observed ray of light coming from some source and t minus t0 is the time that the light took to get here from wherever it started. But of course light travels on null geodesics, so dt is equal to d rho over 1 minus k rho square k of t. <coughs> Right, that's the equation for null radial null geodesic. So, if I integrate both of these, then I get that t minus t zero is basically d, which is the proper distance. Now, proper distance, little I found this term a little confusing. People use it. I'll call it the instantaneous proper distance. It's simply all of this stuff. Okay, we can just <coughs> we are working in a situation where t minus t is small, so we can just call this a approximately a of t zero. distance in the 3 manifold, in the, in the, the whatever maximally symmetric 3 manifold at every time slice. But here uh, we are taking the whole thing including the scale factor and including the curvature factor if any and whatever we get by integrating this thing is defined to be the instantaneous proper distance. 
Now, I am not an expert and I understand there are different ways to measure distance. Which, well, in general relativity, we know that there are different ways to measure distance. But for an actual astronomer, there can be different ways to define the distance between two places. This one would be defined as, when I say instantaneous distance, it really means, imagine that I have a way to get instantaneously from that point to here, then the distance I would cover is that. Of course, I exactly don't have such a way to get from there to here. Okay? So, it's a little hypothetical. On the other hand, for a slowly varying situation, I think it coincides basically with the intuitive notion of distance from there to here. So, the comment is made that for, uh, for uh, small time differences, the, all the definitions of distance finally reduce to one. So, let's take this one as that. Yes, some question. Uh, I mean, don't we don't have instantaneous propagation from one point to another. We don't. We don't have instantaneous propagation. But what I mean is that the metric is ds squared is minus dt squared plus some e of t squared d o squared over 1 minus t o squared, right? So, now in this metric, if I just put dt to be 0, then that's what I mean by instantaneous. dt is 0, then ds is that. That's the thing. You can read more about this. Weinberg and Schoenkerl both have some discussion on this distance. And actually, different ways of measuring distance become quite important for other purposes. But for our purpose, the important thing is that this relation gives us that z is approximately equal to a constant times the distance. So if you forget about all the concerns about how distance is defined, it says that the redshift of a ray of light is linearly related to the distance away from the light source to here and the coefficient is the Hubble constant. So the redshift proportional to distance. And this thing is precisely Hubble's law. If you interpret the redshift as being due to recession of galaxies, so last time we talked about that, that because the expansion is more or less uniform, you can think of the redshift as being the natural Doppler shift for galaxies that are receding from you. In that case, the velocity of the galaxies is proportional to the distance and that's one way that Hubble's law is often written. But more careful people write it as saying the redshift is proportional to the distance. Because this would be correct more generally just follows from definition of the red. So, the distance here really is the, I mean, is it the astronomical distance that you... Yeah, I mean for, so apparently for, so I, yeah, I mean, I haven't thought this through carefully, but my impression is that for sufficiently small distances, it's, or small red shifts, where this is a, where this thing is valid, this truncation is valid, then this is the astronomical. Okay. But now, you can easily imagine, I mean, there are papers on this and somebody mentioned it last time also, that suppose that there is a situation where let's say we have a source and we measure the redshift z and we find that it is 7 or 8 as large as that. It's much larger than 1. Then of course, this expansion is no good. Okay. If t minus t 0 times h 0 was taken to be much larger than 1, then you can't drop the other terms. So, say it's not even self-consistent. In that situation, how this should be correctly done, I don't know. But team, uh, so in fact, the whole this this whole relationship doesn't make precise sense. Okay, so I think it's even correct to say that in that sense, Hubble's law doesn't always hold. Holds for red shifts for small red shifts. Okay, good. Now, <coughs> so this is one observation I wanted to make. That's Hubble's law. Second observation which I learned from Weinberg's book on cosmology and it's very pretty, I'm going to recast it slightly from the way he discusses it, is how to interpret the equation a dot squared minus 8 pi g over 3 rho a squared equals minus k. I hope I've got the equation right. This is one of the Friedman equations. Okay. Now, <coughs> we've talked about some ideal solutions for some particular equations of state and all that of the two equations. But it's sometimes nice to get a physical picture of what is going on. And Weinberg's observation 
is that this looks suspiciously like like t plus v equals e, where t is something like a kinetic energy. If you imagine a of t being the coordinate of some particle, then this is proportional to the kinetic energy. Now, non-relativistic kinetic energy, half m x dot square. And this is proportional to some sort of potential, and this is constant, so it looks like t plus v equals e. That's very good because t plus v equals e is an equation we have been solving since childhood, and we know all these situations when a particle is bound in a potential when it's free to escape to infinity. And here you see that what it means when the particle is bound in the potential, it means that a dot has to uh, go through zero, or the universe has to stop expanding. When the particle is free to escape to infinity, then a dot uh, will not go to zero. The velocity. So if you have a particle whose energy is positive, whose t plus v is positive, then it can escape to infinity. So it's an analogy, but you can make the analogy much better as follows. Imagine. <coughs> so first of all, this equation is anyway true. So the analogy may help us just mathematically. But actually, it's better than mathematical analogy. So let's try to make it a little better. Imagine a particle with coordinate. These are the with coordinate with actually uh, what is the word? Uh, yeah, with coordinate x i of t whose coordinate can vary as a function of t, but now xi I am not taking to be the coordinates rho theta phi, but the ones that are scaled by the scale factor. Okay, so you can think of it as so xi you can define as a i times xi, and these can be defined as the Cartesian coordinates corresponding to rho theta phi. Okay. And now let's take the particle to be. <coughs> so these are the Cartesian coordinates, and let's assume that x i is a function only of t, and moreover, it is a of t times some x i which is constant. So the particle is. So the way to think of it, it's like a co-moving thing. It's con. It's the particle's motion is due only to the expansion of the universe and not due to any other motion of the particle itself. Okay, so it's it's stationary in the co-moving coordinates. Okay. Now, supposing we try to calculate the kinetic energy of such a non-relativistic particle. Again, I emphasize that we are not we shouldn't be doing non-relativistic physics. We are doing GR. But supposing uh, then the particle has a mass m, so it's half m x i dot square. This can be written half m a dot square times x i square from this equation. Okay, and now this can be rewritten as half m a dot square x i at t zero upon a at t zero square. T zero, if you remember, is always now. Okay, is that clear? Because this relation says that for any time the ratio of capital X i upon a is a constant. So this small x is the same as capital X at t zero divided by a at t zero, or for any other time, but specifically for t zero. So that enables us to remove that unknown small x in this way. Okay. So now this can be written as the half m. Then a dot over a whole squared is the okay. Uh, now we need to be a little bit careful because a dot a over a at time t is the Hubble constant, but this is a dot at t over a at t zero, so it's not quite the Hubble constant. Probably we don't need to do that. <coughs> let's just leave it in this form. Okay. Let's calculate v, and now let's try to guess what sort of potential we're talking about. Since we're making some non-relativistic approximation, v. Should naturally be take a particle sitting here. This is that point x i of t, and let's assume it's in the gravitational potential of all the matter inside this sphere. 
Okay. Now, what is going to be the matter? That matter is going to be so it's going to be uh, whatever G M M over X. So it's going to be minus G Newton times the mass of the particle times the mass of matter contained in a sphere over mod of the radius of this, right? So far so good. What is the mass of matter? The mass of the matter is rho, the density, times 4 third pi uh, a pi x cubed. Okay? Now, this, again from this relation between capital X and small x, it's rho times for third pi a of t cubed and then you get small x cubed which as usual be replaced by capital X at t0 yes. over a0 a0 I, use, I will use consistently for a at the time t0 okay
and therefore now we can tell what is the energy whatever is the constant value of t plus v thanks to the friedman equation this is minus k therefore the whole thing is minus a half m k x i Good. Okay. Now this is very nice because without doing work, we've learned that if k is greater than zero, that's positive curvature. K is the curvature of the three space. So if it's positive, then the energy is less than zero. When the energy is less than zero, the particle doesn't have a chance to escape to infinity. Okay. Now here we should make one little uh, notice one little thing which is that implicitly for this to make physical sense rho should be a positive density but because we have a cosmological constant allowed we have also a possibility of negative density so this thing is not completely water tight but certainly for pure matter or pure radiation the density will be positive and this picture will hold which says that if i have pure matter and positive pure matter or radiation or any combination of the two and positive curvature then the energy effectively is negative and that means that the uh, effective particle with coordinate x cannot uh, escape to infinity so expansion stops and universe collapses back this is something we physically want to know so this kind of reasoning has given us a nice picture if k is less than 0 that implies that the energy is greater than 0 so it's like a particle which at whose conserved energy is greater <coughs> is positive and therefore it can actually escape to infinity using kinetic energy but the kinetic energy never falls to 0 okay yeah so the previous case when k is greater than 0 yeah that is bounds back to a oscillator Yeah, it bounces back. What what happens exactly? You can it, the picture is very simple and very well known. Here's a potential v as a function of x. Let's say it's like this. Okay, or let's say it's like this. In fact, later we'll see that it's better with like that. Let's say it's like this or something. It has many whatever things. Now the question is, am I here in energy or am I here in energy? Okay. Supposing I am here in energy and x dot is positive, that means my velocity is forward. So I have a kinetic energy that's uh, that's propelling me in this direction. As I reach here, okay, the kinetic energy goes to zero. That's exactly what this line means. Okay, because now the total energy and the potential energy are coinciding, so kinetic energy goes to zero. That means x dot goes to zero. that means in this analogy that a dot goes to zero that means the universe stops expanding and it bounces back on the other hand if it's here and if it's all initially moving that way then it simply keeps moving that way at some point like here its velocity will decrease because the gap available the gap between this line and the potential energy is what is available for kinetic energy the gap may increase but whatever it is it will never change sign to change sign these two the straight line and the potential have to meet and that will be only true if the energy is negative with respect to some zero okay so that's this is just a picture so this says that if k is greater than zero the energy is negative if k is less than zero the energy is positive and expansion continues and there's a critical case when k is exactly zero which is that the energy is exactly zero so it's like being exactly at the top of this one so you asymptotically at infinity your uh, expansion slows down but never quite comes to a point okay so this is some simple picture it's no more and no less than what you could do by solving this differential equation i have not added anything to this differential equation by this analogy but it's nice that the analogy is not completely foolish in fact these two terms really do behave like t and v okay good my actual question is like i am after big crunch yeah. only we 
okay? And rho less than zero is the same as numerical value of lambda being less than zero. So, in the case of positive cosmological constant, the density is positive, but the pressure is negative. In the case of negative cosmological constant, the density is negative and the pressure is positive. Okay, but pressure we have got rid of using the equation of state. So, this is the result. This in turn implies that the acceleration is positive for lambda positive and negative for lambda negative. So, we see that uh, positive lambda causes the universe to accelerate. And negative so we see that if the universe is found to be decelerating there is not too much you can say because the universe is full of matter and radiation early universe was more full of radiation present universe is more full of matter but whatever it is is decelerating that is natural if there is a negative cons uh, cosmological constant, it will decelerate all the more. If it is found to be accelerating, the only one out of all these possibilities is a positive cosmological constant. And what the experiments tell us today, and it's just in the last decade, is that it is accelerating. So, if it is accelerating, there isn't any other explanation in within what I have given you other than positive cosmological constant. However, you should not assume that people are satisfied with the equation of state P equals W rho, you can always invent a new equation of state and attribute, I am sure that there will be some other equations of state with some other situations which will also give rise to apparent acceleration. So that, and also the connection between observations and acceleration can also be questioned. So it is not watertight, okay? but it is our present belief that the most likely explanation for what we see is that the universe is accelerating and that in turn is due to land. Yes, of course, if it is accelerating, it means that lambda is winning over the deceleration caused by these guys. So, of course, the amount of acceleration will determine lambda only when you take into account the other things. So, as usual, you have to take into account everything. Actually, I, uh, for those who find cosmology interesting, Weinberg's book is really wonderful because everything is there. All the stuff I am doing is there. All the stuff I am not doing is also there. All the experimental information is there. Okay. So, yes. Sir, uh, when we are uh, doing these calculations with lambda yes. and seeing that positive lambda causes the universe to accelerate, yes. we, we know that the universe is accelerating in this way. So, the comments we made with the values of k, yeah. that is for the spatial curvature, yeah. and we can, uh, from there we can conjecture uh, from three situations that whether the universe is uh, expand, always expanding or it will come back. So, uh, with lambda, we cannot simultaneously. Uh, Comment anything about it because yeah. those, those I'll leave it to you. Yeah, I'll leave it to you as an exercise to carefully reconcile that statement with this statement as well as with one more calculation. I'll be doing these are three different things. You should convince yourself whether any of them overrides any of the other. As far as I can see, all are true, but the assumptions might be different. So you but remember, there are two Friedman equations. Now I am working with this. Earlier I was deriving consequence from that. But both are always true. So whatever I learn from both has to be true. One is really determining the velocity instantaneously and the other determines the acceleration. Okay. One thing though I can point out to you is that we have seen an example of this competing effect when we realize that the universe can be made to stop. A can be made independent of time, that is the so called Einstein static universe. Okay? When we insisted on that, we found that rho plus 3p is 0, and we found that that can be from partly matter and partly positive cosmological constant. So, there we are seeing that it is doing the job. Okay? The the, what is happening is the matter is causing deceleration, and positive cosmological constant was causing acceleration, and together they were able to stop the acceleration. Then you have to also ask. Who is responsible for uh, stopping the velocity? Because the stop the static universe means no velocity, no acceleration. Okay. In that case, you see this one we can't possibly set to zero because we have set rho plus three p equals zero. Okay. 
Okay, and we, and this was done without only having pressureless dust. So if that was the case, then this can't be zero. Then K has to come in, and then what is going to be applied? So all everything applies at the same time. Only the emphasis is. But think about it more. There is plenty more that one can think of. Okay. <coughs> Now, because of our focus on acceleration, it is natural to define a parameter. If you think about it, we have been working with H0, which is A dot over A at t equals T0. So, it tells me the velocity today, and it is normalized by dividing by A0 because that makes it a very convenient parameter. So, there is another parameter called Q0 which instead we define in terms of A double dot and we normalize it in some convenient way. So what we do is first of all we divide it by A of T. This makes it cancels the A if you like the scale of A cancels out in this way. But it's still got two time derivatives. So we could naturally divide it by Hubble parameter square which also has two time derivatives. Now it is a completely dimensionless number and we evaluate it at t equals t. And we put a minus sign in the definition. So this has the name deceleration parameter. Now if you want to think about the expansion of A of t, remember it was A of t naught into 1 plus t minus t naught and here again Hubble h naught and the next one will be half t minus t naught squared and here will come A double dot upon A. So that is nothing but minus h squared q. So it is Hubble constant squared q naught. So here you can see how Q appears in the expansion. In a way it is like saying let H0 into T minus T0 which is dimensionless, let that be a parameter then this is the square of that divided by 2 and whatever multiplies it we call it minus of Q0. Okay. Now what I understand is that in the era of low redshift which would be the era of older observations when we couldn't observe very distant galaxies so well, H0 and Q0 were the two crucial parameters of astronomy, the whole of, of cosmology. The whole goal was to determine these two parameters. So, in fact, there's some statement that astronomy is the science of two parameters, H0 and Q0. Okay. Maybe only cosmology is the science of two parameters, H0 and Q0. But now that's not the case anymore. And I imagine that's because this expansion has such limited validity as we have already seen Hubble's law does not make sense and therefore this also will not make sense if the redshift is something like 6 or 7. So, you should keep that in mind. Okay. Still Q0 is a nice parameter and we can do a little calculation with it. So, we can use this second Friedman equation to determine Q0. So, Q0 is all that. So, let me multiply that stuff on both sides. So, A of T will nicely cancel this and I will get uh, minus 4 pi G over 3 H naught squared rho plus P. Uh, but not minus perhaps because there is a minus built into Q naught. That is actually plus of that stuff. Okay. Now, we can use the fact and this is of course all today, this is all at t equals t0 because q0 is a quantity that is defined today at t0. So everything on the right is at t0 but now, so the, this thing therefore we will write now as rho0 plus 3p0, the 0 subscript is always for today and what divides it is 3h0 squared over 4 pi g, where have you seen that before? It is twice the critical density. So it's twice rho critical today. That also is 
Rho critical is also time dependent because it actually was defined with h of t, not h zero. But so this is it. Okay. Now, <coughs> supposing we look at the first treatment equation today, one way of writing it would be to divide by a dot squared, and then you would have rho over rho critical minus k upon k dot squared. This is the statement that all the omegas add up to 1. That's this equation. Okay. So, evaluating this today gives me rho naught over rho critical 0 minus k upon so this I can write as this is a dot squared at t0 so that's the same as Hubble parameter squared times a naught squared probably we will tell this before. actually I don't need that fact here but okay doesn't matter Okay. Now let's use this to say something about Q naught. Okay. You see that Q naught is something like rho naught over rho critical naught, which is this, except that it has a pressure term. But the pressure term will go away if I make an assumption about some equation of state like matter or radiation. Then the whole thing will be proportional to rho naught, so it will be proportional to this side. So very simple to see. For matter, we simply drop the pressure piece. So for matter, we have, uh, so if I multiply this whole equation by half, then this is Q0. So Q0 minus K over H0 squared, A0 squared was half. This is nice because Q0 is a dimensionless parameter and now we see that half is its critical value for matter. Why? Because if Q0 is greater than half, then K has to be positive and of course if it's less, then K has to be negative and if Q0 is exactly half, then K is 0. Things that we have already seen but put in another light, now interpreted in terms of acceleration parameter or deceleration parameter. Notice that Q0 is going for matter of any kind or radiation is going to be positive which means there is deceleration. That's why it's called the deceleration parameter because matter and radiation both cause deceleration. So Q0, the natural sign of Q0 is positive. But among positive signs, it could be between 0 and half or it could be greater than half. We don't know what it is. And if it's greater than half, then the curvature is positive. If it's less than half, the curvature is negative. And if it is half, then the curvature is zero. Now the same equation easily holds uh, if you um, switch to radiation, but with a crucial factor of 2, for radiation, what happens is that the equation of state puts 3 P0, so basically P0 is one third of rho naught, so this whole thing is twice rho naught. So the two cancels, and for radiation, you therefore find that Q0 minus K upon the same factor is equal to 1. So now the critical value of Q0 is 1. So Q0 greater than 1 or less than 1 gives me the curvature greater than 1. So these are various ways of, of linking the acceleration equation, possibly using the other one, with things that one might observe, because Q0 is something we could observe. Sorry? For matter, the factors should be k by the second term. I'm not giving. For matter, the factors in the second term should be k by two. K by two, possible. Doesn't matter. Right. Good. Yeah? Okay. Good. Now the last thing which we want to do today and that's really very interesting is again to recycle these equations 
the equation, uh, these equations to find uh, the age of the universe. Okay, the age of the universe is again an experimentally measurable quantity. How? At least you can bound it because if you can estimate the age of anything in the universe, then the age of the universe should be more than that. So that helps people to approach the estimates of age of the universe. It would be the age of the large oldest thing in the universe, more or less. Okay. So let's try to work that out again using these, and we'll find that. Uh, I, I think I referred to it last time, but we'll find that uh, some of the possibilities, like pure matter dominated universe, are inconsistent with observations. Okay. So now we are going to really, for the first time, derive an equation which assumes everything is in it. There is matter, there is radiation, there is cosmological constant and there is curvature, all four. And so omega matter plus omega radiation plus omega vacuum plus omega curvature, this is equal to 1. These are all time dependent quantities. If I put a 0 subscript, then they are evaluated at today. That is also adds up to 1. Okay. Now, <coughs> for uh, so omega, of course, omega i for i equals the first three m, r, and d, matter, radiation, and cosmological constant or active energy, is given by rho i over rho i critical. Sorry, over rho critical, not right. Rho critical doesn't have an index. So it's this. So this is 3 Hubble squared upon 8 pi g rho i of t. Okay. Now let's rewrite this in a way which will enable us to add all the contributions and basically implement this equation. So we rewrite it as follows. Uh, this quantity rho i over rho critical is equal to rho i today over rho critical today times rho i over rho i today times rho critical today times rho critical. It's pretty obvious. I've just multiplied by things which cancel. So these two rho i zeros cancel and these two rho grid zeros cancel. So I get rho i over rho critical, which is the correct thing. So far so good. Okay. Now the first factor we call omega i comma zero. It's the density today over the critical density today. Okay. Again i runs over all these values. Uh, the second factor is what? It's rho i over rho i today and this exactly is the growth of rho with the scale factor and depends on the equation of state and the precise uh, way it grows is that it's a naught over k to the power what is the power? 3w plus 1 Or, or 1 plus, uh, sorry, or w plus 3, w plus 3, no, <coughs> 1 plus 3, 1 plus 3w, let's give it a shot, so no, this is not good, no, it's not 1 plus 3w, I had done it last time but I have forgotten what we considered it, we found rho variation with t perhaps, but we must have also found the variation of rho with a, uh, Whatever it is, is 3 for matter and 4 for radiation, 2 for curvature and 0 for vacuum. Uh, 3 into 1 plus W, I like that. That's much better. Yeah. Okay, so WI, we are doing it for the three different types. Uh, that and the last factor. Of course, it's simple. The last factor is nothing but Hubble squared, Hubble zero squared over Hubble at t squared. Okay. Is this clear?
And now actually, now that we have got it in this form, you can extend I to run over also curvature. Matter, radiation, vacuum, and K with the W for K being minus one third. We learned this last time. Okay, so in that case, the power of A naught over A is two. Okay, so this is the value of each of the four omegas, and all four of them add up to one. So we get the grand equation: omega m. Zero a not over a cubed. This is the matter one. Omega radiation today a not over a to the four plus omega vacuum today and no power because for vacuum remember W is minus one plus omega of curvature today and a not over a to the two is one. Sorry, ah, is actually not one exactly. It's h of t over h not square. Look that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, for the last term, it will be there because this equation goes for the first three terms. And that's why I just wrote this. Can extend i to run over all of them with this because the whole point of omegas is that omega k is actually given. But it's not given as a true density over critical density, but it is given by this formula with W equals minus one. Okay, and finally you have to add all four of them to get one. So that's the answer, and this gives us a nice equation. So for this, we simply have to make one substitution. We've already defined the redshift as a upon a naught, a of t upon a naught. Is one plus z, or was it one over one plus z? Uh, I think it's one over one plus z, no? Today we started with two values. Yeah, so it's one over one plus z. This is good. Oh, no. T is the time of emission. Zero is the time of day. So if this t uh, is before us, then this is less than one. Therefore, this is less than one. Therefore, that is greater than one, which is what we observe. Hmm. Moreover, we see that in particular, supposing we were at the start, at the origin or beginning of the universe, t equals zero. At t equals zero, a of t is zero, as per the standard formula for matter radiation and so on. Therefore, z is infinity. This is the statement that if a ray of light came to us now from the there is no bound on the redshift. A ray of light coming from the beginning of the universe will have infinite redshift. Okay, so this gives us a boundary condition, and we can integrate that equation as follows. So that equation now says that uh, okay, so we, from this we get that a dot upon a is minus z dot upon 1 plus z. Sir, today, at first you mentioned that a by a naught is 1 plus z. But that is not there. But that is contrary to I wrote the a naught over a is 1 plus z. No, I wrote no, a of no. t2 upon a of t1. No, yes, sir. In the last class, you wrote this one. Yeah. But today you wrote it. You wrote it by a of t naught as 1 plus z. When? First, first, first. Ah, when I was doing the Hubble's law, yeah. then I wrote it wrong in that time. Yeah. Not impossible. Where did I? I wrote. You said last time. Ah, a of t equals a of t not into one plus z. Sorry. Yeah, that doesn't look very good. Yeah, what have I done? Here yeah, I've done something wrong. A of t is a of t not into one plus z. No, this can't be right. Yeah, I think we have to reverse it. A of t not equals a of t. 
I mean, this is a, this equation is to first order, so minus just with the minus, minus will be okay. But the second order equation, I'm a little more worried about. So please figure out the second order is when do not uh, define. Just figure out what's the correct version of that. Please. I could have written it wrong. Probably wrong. Anyway, physically, this has to be right. So now we want to take that equation, and so we can take this equation and write it as bring h0 on the left, then take the square root of omega m0 and 1 plus z cube plus omega r0. I'm writing it all out explicitly, but probably there could have been a better condensed notation. Everything has its characteristic power of 1 plus z, the square root of the whole thing. So I've taken h0 here and square rooted this whole thing. So the answer is h of t on the right side. But h of t is minus z dot over 1 plus z. Okay. So from this, we can write this as dz by dt, take dt on this side, bring everything else down on the other side and we can integrate the equation. We gave integral dt equals integral minus dz over 1 plus z, there may be some h not somewhere. 1 by h naught here, 1 by h naught and then here is that whole square root again. Right? That's going to be everything under this square root. Okay. What are the limits? On the left side we will take t to go from the beginning of time up till today and so on the right side we take the redshift to go from infinity to 0. And this right side by simple change of variables 1 over 1 plus z we can call x or something or 1 plus z we call x, no 1 over 1 plus z we call x hardly changes anything much and then if this integral dx over x root now the roots are with powers of x so omega m0 x to the minus 3 omega r0 x to the minus 4 omega v0 plus omega k0 x to the plus 2. Why does the redshift go to 0? Sorry? Why does the redshift go to 0? The redshift goes to 0 because light which is emitted today and absorbed today has 0 redshift. The redshift, redshift is defined with respect to today by this Okay, so now you see you have a completely explicit equation. What does it do? You just plug in four measured quantities. Actually, you don't need to measure all four of them because remember that omega m0 plus omega r0 plus omega v0 plus omega k0 is also equal to 1. So, one of them can be even eliminated from this. Okay, so three need to be measured by whatever means or they need to be postulated depending on your theory. Whatever you postulate, carry out the integral from in 0, now it's 0 to infinity or 1 to infinity. Sorry, 0 to 1 plus 0. 0 to 1 I mean, yeah. Okay, yes? So you have substituted 1 plus z equal to x. No, 1 over 1 plus z equals. dz over 1 plus z is minus of dx over x. Logarithmic relation. So it's the same whether you do 1 plus z or 1 over 1 plus z, except for the sign. So it removes the minus sign. Whatever you do, it will come to the same sort of thing. Right? For example, you can multiply this through with the power of x if you want. Anyway, this is what we have. And And the left side is, where is the left side? Ah, 
integral of dt. So, this is t0. And what is t0? It's exactly the age of the universe. So, now let's try to see some simple consequences. You can just do all the pure cases one by one. So, matter. Now, let's say pure matter. Then, of course, this equation tells me that if I'm putting all these to 0, then omega m0 is 1. Okay, so in this equation it's 1. So I get x to the minus 3 half outside. So it's dx over, so it's dx root x. Okay, integral of dx root x from 0 to 1 is um, 2 by 3. So I get 2 by 3. Hmm. Is that good? I can't always evaluate my integrals wrong, so this time I have done it right. Very good. Now, if you plug in the known value of Hubble constant or the best estimated value, then this comes out to be approximately 1 times 10 to the 9 years. Okay. And what I understand is the current estimate of age of the universe is 10 times this is, 10 to the 10 years. Okay, So it's not a big difference. In fact, here in this fact, you see a stark difference between cosmology of today and cosmology of 10 or 15 years or 20 years ago. 20 years ago, this was okay. This value was a good estimate of the age of the universe. Therefore, a purely matter-dominated universe with no cosmological constant was fine. Okay, But today, this is not compatible just by a factor of 10. That's pretty good. I mean, that's, you know, this is not a very high precision science because of the hugeness of numbers and the number of estimates which go into it. But the fact that we know it's 10 to the 10 from our various reasons and that contradicts this rules out the fact that we have purely matter. So we need to lengthen the age of the universe and I leave it to you to convince yourselves that a cosmological constant in this thing will lengthen the age of the universe compared to what I have written here. You can convince it's a simple integral. You can do it for all the cases. Okay. One thing is that the pure cosmological constant, so let's put all these to zero and have pure cosmological constant. Then of course it's just dx over x. So that gives you an infinite age. A log, log of 1 upon 0, so that's infinity. So that shows that the cosmological constant lengthens the age of the universe. All by itself, it would make the age infinity. So that means that combining that with matter and radiation, you are going to get some number between this and infinity, which is good. So it's on the correct side, you can make it longer. Okay, if the age of the universe was shorter than this, it might have been a problem. If you experiment it that it's shorter than 10 to the 9 years, then I suppose there would have been a problem. Okay. So I'm not going to do all the other cases, but basically we have a master formula. And one thing, maybe this is also nice if somebody wants us one more possible project. There's an extension of this formula to measure what are called, to calculate what are called luminosity distances. Okay. It's a similar formula with some other power of x inside, but similar integral. And the beautiful thing is that in that case, you get a function of z. Okay, so you don't put z to 0 to infinity, you put it 0 to some fixed value of z. And you can actually plot data which you observe from supernovae versus the redshift and determine the luminosity distances as functions of z and compare with this. Okay, and those data are the kind of things which really can tell you what fraction of each of these is present in omega today. Okay, And the rough answer, if I have got it right, is that this is 0 0.3, this is 0 0.7, and both of these are very close to 0. So today, this, these are today. So I, I don't know the answer with better precision than this, but So although the cosmological constant that is deduced from this is very small numerically, as a fraction of the total omega of the universe, it's 70%. Which also says that until 10 years ago, we had no idea about 
of the makeup of the universe because it's dark energy. Or interestingly, or equally interestingly, point three that is matter. Now you have to ascribe it to what you know, all the matter that you know. And unfortunately, most of the matter that we know, all the matter we know, fails to make up this number. This number translates into a particular density divided by rho particle. So is that really the density of the universe? This is observed by comparing some formula like this with some luminosity distance from supernovae. But does it really work out to be the density of matter in what we know of the universe? If that fails, then there must be some extra matter in the universe satisfying the equation of state of this, and that extra matter is called dark matter. Okay. So these considerations tell us both about the existence of dark energy, that is this factor. And most of this factor is in fact dark matter. A very small fraction of this is known matter. Okay, there are many more considerations. So that's what the whole book is about. The Weinberg's book is about that. So you're welcome to look at it. Okay. So I, I close with one small observation about acceleration. That's very amusing. <coughs> Since h is equal to a dot over a. What is the time variation of h, the Hubble parameter? It's a double dot over k minus a dot over k squared. Okay. Now notice that a double dot is greater than zero. Not but notice see, this is follows from experiment accelerating universe. So we know that a double dot is greater than zero. But that doesn't mean that the Hubble constant is increasing because there is this extra term. So it's perfectly possible to have h dot less than zero. So this is an amusing fact built into our definition that Hubble constant can be decreasing but universe can be accelerating. Whether it is or not I am not able to tell you right now. But um, it's just you should just this just warns you to keep in mind that there are two ways to think of acceleration. One is a double dot, and the other is rate of change of Hubble constant. Two natural ways to think of it, which are related. Good. So I'm done with that. Uh, now my plan is that next Tuesday I'm going to talk about. Cosmological evolution in presence of a scalar field. Okay, so what we'll do is instead of having p and rho on the right side of Einstein's equation and satisfying an equation of state which we have to assume, we'll assume that some scalar field is responsible for the energy momentum tensor. So in that case, the equation of state does not need to be assumed. There is no assumption about that. But the scalar field may have its own potential, which may have to be assumed. But of course, then that's part of whatever theory describes that field. And we'll try to see how that modifies some of these things to some extent. And maybe I'll give some indication how inflation uh, is studied in that context. And, but it will be whatever I can do on next Tuesday. And then on Thursday, the plan is to do also normal frames, totally different subject. And that will be the last lecture. Yeah, you told that you will do some of frames. Do you do some? Some fermions. That is basically related to the orthonormal frames. So all that parts and what I want to do is gravitational radiation, which is unfortunate. Gravitational free radiation. So that that I, I think somebody better do that as a project. It might even be the easiest job. Yeah, some question. Try to do a you know try to so um, what. Uh, Next, I mean, I'm going to be more and more busy, but still next week, uh, just drop in, call, call me on 2422 and drop in one by one and talk about your problems. It won't take more than 15 minutes per person. And if you haven't given your home second homework, give that and I'll give you the third homework definitely next week and that will be 